Um, I'm Carol Cochrane, and I'm very excited about this presentation that we're about to have. Um, it's Working Towards Sustainability, the Colorado Green Business Network, and EcoCycle's Tools to Face the Plastic Pollution Reduction Act. We have some stellar presenters here, and I'm very excited. Raina is here from the, the uh, CDPHE. You're, this is what I just have from your bio, that you're the Manager of Green Business and Environmental Assistance. Yeah. It's pretty huge. And Oakley is here also uh, from Colorado Green Business Network as a green business specialist. And then Randy is here as in a command performance because Rachel um, came down with COVID, poor thing. And um, he is EcoCycle's Director of Policy and Community Campaigns. So there's going to be some great information for um, everyone's businesses. Hi. All right. So my name is Oakley. As Carol mentioned, I'm a green business special with, specialist with the Colorado Green Business Network. Um, for those of you who don't know what the Colorado Green Business Network is, we are a completely free voluntary program that provides sustainability coaching and the possibility for recognition for Colorado businesses. How do we do this? We're funded by the EPA and also state funds so that we can offer this service to all Colorado businesses for free. And when I say businesses, that includes nonprofits, big corporations, small corporations, even government. So um, no matter which Colorado business or organization you are, we can help you out. Um, we're focused on supporting and recognizing excellence in sustainability and also in equity. Um, we're, we currently have 153 members of businesses, and um, we've served thousands since our founding. We've been around for 25 years. So we have a really, really great network um, of businesses. Okay, so there's two main ways to be supported by the Colorado Green Business Network. The first is our support level. Um, the support level means that we give you all technical assistance, our team of five, small but mighty. Um, we come on site if you would like. We do an assessment. We tell you all of our recommendations for sustainability. And all that's required to be in that support level to get all of those benefits is registering on our online software, Green Biz Tracker, which we'll talk about later. So support level, all you have to do is register with us and you get access to our team and all of our knowledge. You can ask us sustainability questions and we can come on site. The other option, in addition to support, people pick and choose between the two. Um, you can also do both, is uh, recognition. So what does recognition entail? It means filling out online surveys. Um, once a year, they're due on June 30th every year. And depending on how many points you achieve through those surveys, you get bronze, silver, or gold. Bronze is 25 points, silver is 50, gold is 100. And although the surveys may seem intimidating, there are a total of almost 400 points. And all you have to do to get gold is 100. So don't worry, we're here to help you through the surveys. If any of you in this room ever decide to go through that and feel a little overwhelmed, we're here to get you there. And it's very simple to be recognized. Okay, so what are the benefits of Colorado Green Business Network other than getting free sustainability coaching? So um, you also get to be part of our community. So we do a lot of connection between businesses, between breweries, between um, manufacturing. Uh, we connect mutual businesses together so that they can learn from each other um, in their operations. Uh, we also have monthly newsletters and workshops. So basically, you're just connected to other like-minded businesses in Colorado. And um, Raina will talk more about what the benefits of actually being recognized are. Um, and then, of course, the other benefit of just sustainability in general is that your employees are more engaged and also that you can lower costs. So for instance, replacing LED lights you would get a return on interest on that in a year. So sustainability can also be a very profitable thing to do as well. So what is this opportunity assessment? So as I was mentioning before, we can come on site to your business and we can do an evaluation where we provide you specific recommendations for your business about next steps in sustainability. So this is a customized report that we give to you after we come on site. In addition to um, in addition to our opportunity assessment, we also have just a huge batch of resources for different sectors um, in terms of one pagers, hey, how do you create a greenhouse gas inventory, for instance? 
So all of this knowledge is already here for us to send to you. And we also have this data tracking template, which if we move this up a little bit, there's a QR code for the data tracking template. And that's a template that we created for you to track your utility, your utility usage. So we have a lot of tools like this that we can just hand to businesses that help them become more sustainable. Next slide. So now Raina will speak. Raina, if you had anything else to add with the support level or just general benefits, go for it. Cool. Yeah. And I think I need to be where you are. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So yeah, I mean, as Oakley was sharing, our program really kind of, our intention is to meet businesses where they're at. So no matter where businesses is, whether it's just really learning about sustainability and trying to figure out how to implement the technical assistance is great there. Um, if a business is already doing a ton, wants to get some recognition and also learn how to do more, we provide assistance and recognition. So benefits of recognition, we have some kind of standard stuff signed certificates, window decals, all that good stuff. Um, I would say some things that we also do is we do provide additional state support. So we provide letters of recommendation for grant applications. So as you probably all know, there are tons of grant opportunities, state and federal. Um, a lot of businesses don't know about those grant opportunities. I actually was just with a small business the other day that had replaced all of their LED lighting themselves, even though Excel will provide a free lighting replacement. So those are the kinds of things that we make sure our businesses know about when they happen. If there's a new program that comes out, a new grant opportunity, we're making sure our businesses are connected with that. And we provide those letters of support for our recognized businesses. We also try to advocate for priority permitting. Um, we have leadership opportunities and speaking opportunities. We also have our statewide recognition event, which just happened last week, um, where we just kind of come together and celebrate. There are some additional awards there. So the most important thing I would say are kind of two pieces. One, our businesses really value the community that they get to be a part of. It's really a community where our gold level members are perpetually asking, like, who can we mentor? Are there bronze level mentors that could benefit from coming to visit us or from support around best practices and procedures? Um, and the recognition event, I think, is just an opportunity, especially as sustainability professionals. We tend to spend a lot of time like, in our silo trying to figure it out. And so just the ability to connect across the community is a recharging opportunity, I think. And then also just that opportunity to learn from what other folks are doing. So it's really cool. And I would say, um, you know, I have this little metric here, 31% of customers want third-party certification as a way of verifying practices. I think people are very wise to greenwashing at this point. And so, you know, our program provides a free option for that third-party certification. Cool. In terms of the program structure, a couple things I always like to mention. We do have a facility-based versus corporate or multiple site recognition. So if you work for an organization that has like 10 locations, you don't have to fill out 10 applications for the program as long as you meet certain criteria. Um, but we do facility-based recognition mostly and support um, we also do have an annual reporting requirement for our recognition program specifically, and then also a recertification. So there is continued engagement that we ask for from businesses. And part of that is so that we can constantly be supporting our businesses. Even gold level businesses still have steps they can take. So it's really about us being able to stay in touch with our businesses and continue to do that work to make sure that that continual improvement is happening. The last piece I always like to mention is we do have a compliance requirement. So compliance with statewide environmental regulations, we kind of see that as a standard. So we don't recognize businesses that don't meet those standards. So if a business does have violations, we tend to put off recognition, work with them on making sure they're meeting those environmental compliance regulations, and then we can move towards recognition again. Um, but we do have a compliance requirement as part of our application. We like to mention that because Sometimes people get worried about it, but don't worry. It's not a scary process. We walk people through it. Um, the last thing I did want to mention, this is a QR code to the registration page in GreenBiz Tracker if you want to check it out. Um, we have an online system for managing all of our applications. So for businesses that do want technical assistance, GreenBiz Tracker is the place that you start. You register. There's a welcome survey where you tell us a little bit about what you're looking for. And then we contact you and we move on from there. So this is the tool we use. It's a pretty intuitive user interface. This is what the front page looks like. You can see the little get started button. 
and people are taking pictures. <laughs> and again, this is the only thing you need to do to be at our support level is yeah. register on Green Biz Tracker. Yeah. And if you move to the next slide, you can kind of see what that looks like when you go to the surveys tab. So we have a welcome survey. The welcome survey is really designed to give us the information we need to be able to go out on site and work with you one-on-one. -on -one. And then the recognition application is those following three surveys. So you don't need to fill any of those out. We also tend to, a lot of our technical assistance is designed to also help you get recognition because the idea is, is that our application should be the best practices that you're employing anyway, right? Like if you're realizing reductions in energy, water, waste, fuel use, if you're employing best practices with regard to purchasing and policy, you're going to be able to get recognition in our program because that's what we're looking for. Um, so the technical assistance is a really solid place to start if you're interested in the program because it really allows us to meet with you one-on-one -on -one and build that relationship so that it doesn't feel daunting just looking at a big to-do list and we can really kind of help you get started. Um, I also wanted to just give a quick shout out. We have this giant technical manual. If you are one of the people who really likes getting in the weeds with data, um, it basically is a page by page of every question we ask. Every question in our application is coded. So you see this little E3. So you can look up question by question and get individual um, criteria and information about how we score it and what we're looking for for every question in our, in our application. So it's really a transparent process. And that's it. We're going to hold questions. And I'd love to introduce Randy Mormon, who is with EcoCycle, who's going to talk a little bit about the polystyrene ban and some resources for businesses. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, you, Randy. Thank you. Get, get your... Oh, go back. Oh. It flips really fast. There we go. <laughs> um, good afternoon. My name is Randy Mormon. I'm the Director of Policy and Community Campaigns at EcoCycle. My colleague, Rachel Setsky, was to be here with you today, but she came down with COVID and has absolutely no voice. Um, so hopefully she is on the mend, but I am um, very happy to be with you and her place. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. Just give a little bit of introduction to EcoCycle. Um, we started in 1976, started as a uh, grad students project at CU, decided let's go around and collect cans and newspapers and see if we can get them enough quantity, and then try to sell that as a fundraiser for um, nonprofits. And little did he and others know that volunteered in that effort knew that we would still be kicking today in, in the organization that we are today. Um, and over the past uh, 47 years, we have been very busy helping communities reduce waste um, and increasing recycling and composting. And we do that by engaging all sectors in the community. Um, and so we run a fleet of trucks. Actually, uh, two of them are the first electric trucks in the state of Colorado. And we collect recycling and compost for businesses in Boulder County. Um, we run the Boulder County Recycling Center. So that is where all single stream material that is collected either at the home or at a business goes in Boulder County to be sorted and then sold in the market. Um, and so that is that is owned by the county, but we have been running it since it, um, its inception. And we operate a Center for Harder Recycle Materials, one of the first in the country as well, our charm. And, and that is where we take materials that don't fit in your recycle bin. So think about bicycle parts, yoga mats, mattresses, electronics. And we again try to uh, work very hard to find uh, local markets for those materials. We work with our public schools to develop compost and recycling programs in those schools in Boulder County and parts of Adams County and in Broomfield. Um, and we teach students about sustainability and circularity. Um, we also work with state and local governments on policy, and that is helping them to achieve their sustainability goals through zero waste, how they can reduce waste and really work towards a circular economy at the local level. So basically, we figure out what works, we create some models, and then we try to export those models to all parts of the state. Um, and so we are really here to innovate, implement, and advocate for zero waste practices and helping to make a more sustainable, equitable, and climate resilient future. So that's who we are as EcoCycle. Next slide. So I wanted to jump in now and talk about plastics. Um, that's what we're here to talk about is plastic pollution. And so this is an ever-increasing problem that I'm sure you all are very well aware of. Um, and it's become quite a global crisis. Um, the creation of single-use items in particular, like containers, packaging, bags, utensils, all of that, um, 
require a tremendous amount of energy to make. Um, and then, and that destroys natural resources in that process. And then how they're disposed creates a lot of havoc and problems. Um, and we use them for such a very small amount of time. Um, and by design, they're designed to be used once and only once. Um, and so that ends up becoming quite a problem for us. And, and a lot of them can't even be recycled if we even wanted to try. Um, so they either end up in the landfill or they end up in our environment. And that's where it creates a lot of problems. Um, and that problem is growing and expanding. So 23% of the material in uh, the United States that is landfill is containers and packaging. Um, 18% of our ocean trash comes from plastic food containers, cutlery, and wrappers, and 14% is bags. By 2030, the UN estimates that our production of plastics and single-use plastics in particular is going to double and is also estimated by that time if we continue on this direct tra trajectory that we will have more plastic by weight in the ocean than fish. Um, and the other stat that I also like to throw out that a lot of people don't know is we are consuming on average humans a plastic credit card's worth of plastic a week. It is entering into our bodies, and that's through the air and small particles that we breathe. It's in our water, and it's in our food. So to address this crisis, we really need to be thinking about, one, turning off the tap <laughs> and stopping a lot of this, what we would consider unnecessary plastic. Now, there's a lot of valuable plastic out there that we need. Think about the medical field and automobiles and planes and all the things that we need and, and more durable plastics. But single-use plastics, we really classify as unnecessary. And how do we turn off the tap? And so uh, we need to make a shift from this linear model of take, make, and waste to something that is much more circular. Um, and so that's what we have been working on a lot at EcoCycle and with our partners with Recycle Colorado and Good Business Colorado is another great partner that we've worked with over the years in that, thinking about how do we create this circular economy and that reduces our negative impact on the environment and really builds more resilient supply chains um, to help our local businesses. And of course, then I think help businesses save money and reduce costs to, to consumers as well and customers. All right. Um, I think I'm ready for the next slide. Thank you. Um, so why should businesses care about this? I think there's a number of reasons. Um, one is that employee satisfaction, um, customer approval, and then your bottom line. Let's talk about employees for a second. I think a lot of you know that employees prefer companies that care about what they're doing and what impact they're having on the community, but also the environment. And businesses that are actively engaged and showing that they're being proactive, of course, have higher retention in employees um, and have easier recruitment. Consumers want businesses to be doing the right thing. And they want it to, things to be made easy for consumers to make their right choices in their purchasing. And so all of that comes together, I think, in helping us think, how do we make this better for both businesses and consumers and customers? Um, in fact, a report was just released this year that showed that 84% of American voters support increasing reusable packaging and serviceware. 80% support requiring companies to reduce single-use plastics in particular. And 81% support shifting the cost of plastic cleanup from taxpayers to producers. It's that polluter play, pays model. So we're going to get into some specifics about how plastic reduction practices um, can save businesses money. Um, so let's go to the next slide. But before we do that, I'm going to talk about this Plastic Pollution Reduction Act that was passed at the state level a couple of years ago um, in 21. Um, it is, you know, what I say really goes after the worst of the worst, and that's your single-use uh, um, carry-out bags and polystyrene takeout containers and, and food containers. Now, it took us a couple of years to get it passed. COVID was one of the main factors that delayed our efforts. But once we did... Colorado became the first non-coastal state to take this action. We saw a lot of things happening on the coast, which, of course, you know, they are heavily impacted by what's going on in the ocean and the coast. But for us to not be on a coastal part and be in the middle of the country, we're the first state to take this kind of action and be a leader. And it really, again, aims to reduce single-use checkout bags, polystyrene takeout containers, and also allows municipalities to take action on their own too when addressing plastic pollution. 
Let's go to the next slide, which is our timeline of, of the act. So the first phase went into um, place in January 1 of this year, and that was setting a fee, a 10 cent fee on all carry out bags, both paper and plastic. Four cents of that fee goes to the business to help implement the program, train their employees. If they want to use it to provide reusable bags, for example, to their customers, they could do that with that portion of the fee. Six cents goes to either the municipality or the county if the business is located in an unincorporated area. And that is to help that local government also implement waste reduction practices and, and recycling and composting. And we know a lot of municipalities have used that fund or are going to be starting to use that to pay for reusable bags, for example. The second phase, starting this coming January in 2024, will put a ban on plastic bags and the fee for paper bags will continue and will ban polystyrene uh, food containers and cups. And then um, I did want to note that this past legislative session, there was a bill that fixed um, a drafting error in the original act, which was to require businesses to start remitting their portion of the bag fee to local governments in April of 2024. It moved that up to this year. So they're now required to start remitting that now. Um, and that was just because of a drafting error when the bill was being passed. Um, and also allows the, um, the the change that happened this legislative session also allows businesses that are in jurisdictions that aren't accepting the fee. So there, are, uh, the the it is totally up to the local government if they want to take that six cents from the bag fee and use it for local government purposes. If the local government decides not to, this allows the business to keep all of the 10 cents and use it for waste reduction practices within their business. And specifically says they can use that to buy reusable bags for their customers. Then the final phase of the act will occur in July of 2024, and that is gonna remove an old state law that prohibited municipalities from taking action on uh, regulating plastics at the local level. And so that allowed them to do that in 2024. All right, next slide. So let's talk about bags a little bit more, paper and plastic. Um, we often get that question, which is better? And that really shouldn't be the crux of the question. The crux of the question should be around, should we be using single-use bags? Because both paper and plastic have negative environmental impacts, each unique to their own. So thinking about paper bags, um, they're very resource intensive to make. Most of them come from um, raw timber, so requiring, requiring deforestation to make them. And they require a lot of water to produce, very water intensive. Of course, plastic bags comes from petroleum that we have to drill out of the ground somewhere. Um, and plastic bags are just so hard to keep out of the environment. They're so lightweight that even if you're putting them in the trash or you're putting them in a recycle bin, the wind easily picks them up. They blow out of, of trash trucks. And as you know, they get into our parks, into our trees, our neighborhoods, and into our waterways. And then they break down into microplastics, which become those small pieces of plastic we talk about that not only animals are ingesting, but we as humans can also ingest. So what the good news is that we are seeing um, from decades of these similar laws and other places around the country that customers easily change and adapt. And I have to say, I am so thrilled every time I go to my King Supers in Arvada and I'm checking out and I look down the line and everyone has reusable bags. It's about 85 and 90%. And people change like that overnight. And so it really is spurring that change that we need to see. And I think it's pretty easy. And I think the other advantage for businesses is they're no longer this expectation that you have to provide a single-use checkout bag to customers for free. Um, and so that cost is hopefully um, taking that burden off of businesses as well and not, and not having that expectation anymore. Um, and as we said, in January of 2024, plastic bags will be banned. And that's at large retail stores. But retailers can continue to um, use up their stock after that. And they have until July of 2024 to use up their, their plastic bag stock. And we'll then continue to, um, to charge the 10 cent fee for paper bags if they choose to do so. And again, it's exciting to see like a Walmart uh, in Colorado isn't using plastic bags anymore. They are ahead of the game, even before the ban. So we hope that others will follow suit very soon. 
Um, all right, next slide, please. And who does this all apply to? So really quick, um, there is small business exemptions for this that was um, in the law. And so businesses with more than three uh, Colorado locations are required to participate in, in the bag fees and bans and those that also have um, business locations outside of Colorado. So it's really a carve out for very small businesses um, in the state. It also exempts customers from paying the fee on the bags if they um, are part of state or federal aid programs. So they get to um, not have to um, have to pay the fee either. Uh, and then also there are checkout bags, uh, or excuse me, there are bags that are exempt, plastic bags that aren't checkout. So think about when you go to the produce section and there's plastic bags there, you go to the meat section and you wanna have a plastic bag to keep your meat protected from the rest of your groceries. That is all exempt from the fee as well. And then also when you go to the pet shop and you're going to buy a bag of crickets to feed your pets at home or buy a, a goldfish, um, those are all those types of bags are also exempt. Um, we have a map on our website, ecocycle.org slash PPRA that shows all of the um, jurisdictions in the state that have their own bag laws. So I just want to call that out because uh, municipalities are allowed to do their own regulations on bags. And so it's important if, if you are a business to make sure you're checking with the local laws there to see, because this state law is the floor. And so um, local municipalities can do more than that. And so make sure that if, you know, if you're in Louisville, for example, or Denver, they have their own bag laws. And so make sure that you're complying with those. All right. So I want to direct you to some resources. Um, last year, we developed this toolkit on our website, the Plastic Pollution Reduction Act Toolkit. And so right now it has a lot of stuff about bags and the bag fee um, since that was implemented in January. And it includes a lot of resources for businesses to provide um, and help their employees um, and then also help their customers. So it's like posters like you see up here that can be used in your in your um, shop and um, and also different ways you can help uh, train your employees for, for complying with the law. A number of the graphics then um, are taken here in our slides are part of those tools that you can see on our toolkit. And then we'll go to the next slide and talk about the uh, polystyrene ban that's coming up. So um, that applies to all retail food establishments as it's classified under uh, Colorado State statute. So think of restaurants, fast food, um, cafeterias, even school cafeterias it applies to. And it's all expanded polystyrene serviceware. So that's the cups that you might see coffee served in, as well as the clamshells that are, and those darn styrofoam trays that they were giving in schools. It includes all of that. Um, it goes into effect January 2024. Um, and again, similar to bags, um, retailers are allowed to use up their current stock um, before um, they uh, can no longer use it. Now, while it only applies to what we call polystyrene foam, um, there are other products out there that is polystyrene number six plastic that's not foam. And I would like to get into a little bit uh, about some specifics about all polystyrene and considering and moving away from all of it, not just the foam. So let's go on to the next slide. It really is one of the worst plastics out there. And I just can't say that enough. Um, not only, you know, has it the impact on the environment, but it has a significant impact on human health. Um, over 50 chemical byproducts are released during the manufacturing and making of polystyrene. And a lot of those are carcinogens. And it, it impacts the workers that are in the process of helping to manufacture that product, but also then the frontline communities that live around those types of facilities. So it gets in the air and the water there. The thing that you know, I would say troubles me also is just serving food on these types of uh, plastics because when you think about what causes the leaching of these chemicals into food, it's heat, it's oil, and acidity. So think about what we're putting into this, right? Hot coffee, hot soups, French fries, a burrito, all the things that have heat, grease, and acidity. <laughs> and that's what causes the leaching of these chemicals into our food. 
So as a customer, I am always horrified <laughs> if I get food on a product like that. Um, and and I think that, you know, hopefully as more and more people learn and as part of this law to educate people about this, that people won't want to be getting food on those types of container containers. And people that are crafting this food for people won't want to serve it either um, for those reasons. Oh, and I, and I want to also say that it's not recyclable. That's the other major problem with it as well. But I think that's minor in comparison to the other major problems. Um, so we have created a guide on our Plastic Pollution Reduction Act toolkit on our web- website with um, we're calling sustainable serviceware for alternatives for restaurants to use to polystyrene. Um, it is our newest uh, component of our toolkit. And I want to recognize we've had many municipalities and counties to help support us in, in putting this toolkit together. And it's really intended to help businesses kind of navigate what their options are. And it really puts it on kind of a scale, as you can see, of best choices to worst choices. Um, and thinking about the whole life cycle environmental impacts of these products. And so we kind of say it measures the relative greenness of them. Um, It's a statewide guide. And so I want to recognize the fact that probably some of you, if not all of you are aware, we've had some major changes in composting just this last year. And so we recognize that in putting this guide together. The front range in particular has been mostly impacted by this change and not accepting compostable wear. Um, However, uh, most of the rest of the state and the rest of the country hasn't accepted compostable wear for quite a while. And a lot of those facilities and operations of composting. And then it's just really to reduce the amount of contamination in our compost. And again, getting back to a lot of those things that look compostable but aren't. Um, and that is a contamination problem. And then it gets back to having that breakdown into microplastics and getting it into our soils and our compost. Go to Oh, and then the last thing I'll say before switching to the next slide is that you'll notice then the most preferred alternative is reuse. So I want to talk more about that. So let's go to the next slide. Um, reuse of service wearing utensils saves water. It saves natural resources, energy, and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and this is really, I think, the new frontier that we really need to be working towards. And there's some exciting things happening in this area that I'm going to touch on. Um, but first, for example... If you take over an estimated lifetime of 500 uses and wash cycles, a ceramic cup that a coffee shop might serve coffee to you in uses only 53 gallons of water in its lifetime, compared to 370 gallons needed for that paper coffee cups to be served for the same number of coffees. Um, that you would have gotten in uh, out of that use of that ceramic. So more water is needed to make that paper cup than to wash the ceramic cup. Um, is graphic also available on your website or no? On that uh, resources? That- it comes from this right here. Okay. Upstream Solutions is where that's taken. Gotcha. Okay. So it's not our graphic. Okay. But yeah. Um, and then as you can see up here, the stainless steel cutlery. Um, That breaks even with the environmental impacts of a single-use utensil only after two uses. And then the environmental benefit increases and continues to increase from there. Let's go to the next slide. So what about saving money with reuse? Let's talk about that. Research shows that reuse can save businesses lots of money, switching from a single-use to reusable, especially dine-in is is the, the, the great example of that. Um, if all dine-in restaurants in the United States went totally to reuse, um, they, all the American food service business would save $5 billion annually by making that switch. Um, and even if you think about small businesses um, like food trucks and cafes, they could send, save between $3,000 to $22,000 annually by switching. Now, Commonly, we think of reuse as happening within the store. You've got a dishwasher, you've got reusable utensils and plates and cups. Um, but what's really exciting and happening and it's very innovative is moving beyond thinking that way. And we're seeing some very entrepreneurial businesses in Colorado working with restaurants where they do the washing for you. And so you don't have to have a washer. Um, and so through this method, the food establishment contracts with a reuse company um, to provide the reusable cups, to-go boxes. Um, so think about food trucks even having to-go box. They've been doing that in Portland for a number of years, if you've ever been to their food trucks up there. Um, 
and other needed products. And so what happens then is they collect those items, they wash them, um, they take out the broken ones out of circulation, they return a clean stock to uh, the venue or the food establishment. And it works similar to like checking out library books at the library where the customer checks it out, um, it gets used at the restaurant, they take the food home, and then they have a return system, a place to drop it off, gets washed and gets recirculated again. And what's amazing to me talking to these companies that are doing this now is that their return rate is very high. People actually take them home and return them after they've eaten uh, the food. So that that I think is just more to say about the desire of the customer that wants this kind of um, more sustainable aspect of, of of fast food and, and other types of, of dining. Such a warning, we have 10 minutes left. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm almost done. Let's see. Um, let's... And there's a question. I'm just going to yes. say, you can read off the email on the bottom. I can't um, read the... Uh, okay, so this is upstreamsolutions.org. Yeah, same, it was on the prior slide. Uh, it's from the same company or same group. And then it's forward slash reuse hyphen wins hyphen report. And then the, the email? And that is chart hyphen reuse at upstream solutions.org. Um, so I want to finish with the example of ketchup. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think this is quite surprising. It was to me at least if you take, and this is a simple reuse thing that you can do now, right? Um, you can encourage your customers to bring reusable mugs if, if you know, for coffee, you can encourage them to bring reusable takeout containers for their leftovers, um, for their doggy bag. And just to be clear, Colorado Health Code allows coffee or beverages to be served in customers' reusable um, mugs that they bring in. And as far as like uh, reusable, durable containers to put food in, as long as the food was served to the customer on the restaurant's dishware, it now belongs to the customer. And so the customer can scrape that and put that in their own container. As long as the restaurant is not touching the customer's food container, it's all good, according to the health code. For ketchup, looking at how much it costs per packet of these small packets, this is an estimate that customers in a restaurant could use 150 a day with their French fries or whatever, and that they're taking about three packets per day that costs about $8,000 to that restaurant a year. If you reduce that by 90%, it only costs them $800 a year. How do you do that? Well, there's multiple ways. One is just to only give it to customers if they request it, instead of automatically giving them ketchup packets with everything. Um, providing a way to dispense the ketchup so that the customer makes the choice how much ketchup packets they're going to take, or even even better yet, into um, you know a reusable container of ketchup instead of a disposable packet. So those are some of the ways that, just as an example, that you can significantly reduce your costs and also be reducing the impact on the environment. So I'm going to go to the last slide and finish, and that's the resources again um, for our toolkit, which is ecocycle.org forward slash PPRA. It has a lot more information, just like the ketchup and other ways that you can reduce single use in your restaurants besides moving away from polystyrene. So I will stop there and we'll take questions. <laughs> but if I could add one thing too about food code. So um, there's an organization called the Conference on Food Protection. And it's an organization that feeds into um, FDA, new FDA regulations. And I was just last year on a committee about reusables. And so we've pushed a definition of reusables in the food code. But one of the things that's also come from that is there's actually a guidance document you can find. So if you look up Conference on Food Protection, Safe Use of Reusables, you'll find a guidance document for retail food on all of the best kind of contamination-free processes. So like you spoke to, as long as it's served on something that is contamination-free, um, wax paper is another option for like deli and things like that. They can serve on wax paper and then the customer can put it in their container. There's gravity-fed processes. So there are all kinds of contamination-free processes. I know that's a really common reason that retail food folks don't want to entertain reusables is they're worried about what happens when someone gets sick and it had nothing to do with them. So that guidance document is a really good guidance document to just empower retail food around how can you 
allow people to bring in reusables, but still keep the organization safe. But yeah, what other questions do people have? Super helpful, Dr. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do you guys also uh, do, uh, does CDPHG do um, any kind of joint workshops or Zoom workshops on the application process? Yes. So usually for our program, I mean, year round, we're providing coaching and support for organizations. So if you're interested in applying, feel free to reach out to us and we can just talk you through it. But usually closer to like March, April, May, we do tips and tricks workshops on our application. And then we also year round have workshops that are just skill building workshops. So we have one we're organizing for November. that's just going to be an overview on all of the available grants that are currently coming out of the Colorado Energy office and then also the um, RREO grant, which is the recycling. Do you guys have an email list or something that we can subscribe to to get um, heads up on those or just check your website? So mostly our email list. If you sign up as a support member in our program, you'll be on our email list. So that's the way we usually try to manage that. So I don't know how many of you I speak for, but my biggest stumbling block to applying for this is that I never set aside time in in the day to actually um, focus on do the thing. (laughs) <laughs> anything and so it's like i'm doing you know 22 things spread too thin every small business um, person is this way i think and if you're not don't tell me because then don't have an even bigger complex <laughs> <laughs> but i feel i feel like i would sign up for a, a session that i have a block off in my calendar where you just said okay here's the link to it go let me know when you have questions i'm gonna sit here and make sure you stay for the full hour while you start right. filling the soda. I love that. Yeah. But, yeah. But, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We can do it together if they don't host on the Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have yeah. yeah. given me this resource before and I forgot it existed. And you wrote it down. Why? Yeah. How many times does it Yes. Maybe it's like, easy to do that one time. Like, yeah, just do the thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, yeah. and really and truly, I mean, there are a couple things. Part of the reason I'm grateful to be able to co present this way is that I feel like these are the types of resources that we try and help you skill build to arrange time to use. (laughs) But one of the most common things we recommend to businesses that are just getting started is either is create a green team and schedule time. Because the nice thing about a green team is that it, regardless of how large or small your operation is, if you have a team of people working with you, they're going to notice things you don't notice, right? Like if you're not in the kitchen every day, you're not going to notice what's happening in the kitchen to the same level. So having a team of people, A, means it's not all you doing it. Right. But B, it means that you have people bringing ideas Mm -hmm. and that's going to be a huge help. Um, So we always recommend that. But yeah, just scheduling time, even just scheduling two hours a week that it's like, this is my, I'm going to put on my sustainability hat. And this is the two hours every week that I'm doing the sustainability stuff. Well, I'll go and have a beer at Horse and Dragon. There you go. Yes. Community. Absolutely. That's the thing for me to do. I will never do these things if I don't. And I get that. We actually have done them for bicycle friendly businesses. Oh. Is just come and do the application, and there's a person there who answers questions. That might be something better off in Denver for you guys, but I don't know how many people in Fort Collins. Maybe we can try it though. I'm willing to try it. Yeah. Well, we're always happy to come out. So, like our technical assistance visits can look so many different ways. We do technical assistance visits for a facility where they want they have specific challenges that they're dealing with. We also do performance assessments where if somebody's working on the application, we'll pull, pull a score report and then kind of talk through the application and give them feedback on the process. We can't guarantee we're going to do that like a month out from the deadline, but <laughs> most of the year we try to do those feedback sessions if people ask. So. Yeah. Um, I walked in a little bit late, so you guys might have mentioned this and you probably already told me, so sorry. Um, but is the certification primarily just for those like facilities that are in person? Are there okay? So as like a solopreneur tech company, it's still something good for sample. Great. Yeah. With a lot of these, I often think about honestly Carol, um, because I was on policy council when some of these things were getting approved. And I heard a lot of Carol as a small business with like we're dealing with food and serve, but specifically food service, like what's going to happen with cups when we're doing this and like extending producer responsibility. And it's so good to have those perspectives, but I'm never sure if I should just be a, a referrer, which I'm also excited to be, right? Should I just be talking to our clients to do this certification or is it something we should do ourselves? Yeah, we, we serve all Colorado organizations from nonprofits to churches to other people who are one person working from home. So it really, or manufacturing, huge manufacturing. So anybody who wants help 
Sustainability. Yeah. And have it. Yeah. yeah. And we do have recognized businesses in our program too that are one person shows. So yeah. it's truly an all size kind of situation. Right. Yeah. Awesome. I'm serious. Let's tackle that. Yeah. yeah. I, I just would say thank you so much for being willing to to present this, and I hope you guys all like spread the info because yeah. it, it would be great to have a ripple effect out of this room yeah. and out of the recording. 